Uh, thank you all very much for coming. My name is Scott Anderson. I'm with Miller Edge. I'm the um, Eastern Regional Sales Rep for Miller Edge. I've been with Miller Edge for about three years. I've been in the door industry for over 20, uh, working at the dealer level, like most of you folks, uh, installation, sales, management, that sort of thing. And today we want to talk a little bit about uh, Miller Edge product, uh, some more on the technical side as opposed to the sales side. Um, at Miller Edge, we feel it's important for you folks to understand the product, uh, not only from the sales level, but also from the, the installation level, uh, troubleshooting, replacement, that sort of thing. So we've, we've labeled this uh, presentation Tech's Corner for all the technicians and folks out there that are interested in learning a little more. Uh, today's agenda, we're going to talk about understanding codes and UL requirements. We're going to speak a little bit about Miller Edge. Uh, we're going to talk about risk assessment. And we're also going to uh, present some resources to you folks at the end of the presentation. Uh, we'll take a quick review of UL requirements. ANSI ANSI UL325 is the nationally accepted safety uh, standard for doors, drapery, gates, and louvers. Okay, we know that there were additions to that in August of 2010. And what those additions included for the commercial industry was a monitored uh, external entrapment uh, protection for CDOs, for commercial door operators. Uh, we'll take a quick review again of UL. They must be independently tested by UL or a nationally accredited testing lab and tested as a system. So what that means, folks, is that if you have a UL approved product that is a standalone approved UL product and it has not been tested as a system with uh, a Chamberlain product or a down the, the line of, of manufacturers, and it is not uh, listed in the operator instructions as being tested and UL approved as a system, then that is not going to be within compliance of UL 325. Um, Miller Edge has been tested and approved uh, with all of the major operator manufacturers out there. So if you were to take your installation booklet and open it up, you would see Miller Edge listed as a UL 325 approved product uh, as a monitored device in compliance with UL 325. Um, if, if not, if the installer chooses to not install an approved uh, monitor device, then the door would be set up for what they call moment, uh, momentary contact so that the actual person operating the door is now themselves monitoring the door by holding the button in to complete a full cycle to close. More codes and standards. Again, UL325. Most folks don't know this, but UL325 is cited in OSHA. So OSHA, Occupational Safety and Health. And some folks may say, well, gee, doesn't that just pertain to the workplace? Well, it does. So UL325 is cited in OSHA. It's also cited in the IBC, which is the Inter International Building Code. Uh, it's cited in the International Fire Code and also, also NFPA 70. So what, what happens is, if we start to look into this verbiage uh, with OSHA, IBC, IFC, and, and, and NFPA, we would find that it refers back to UL325. So very, very important information for folks that are actually selling and installing products and complying with UL325. Uh, important information for you folks. I'll talk about the construction of a Miller Edge. This is a factory sealed edge, and basically it, c it consists of what we would call our extrusion or our profile. This, this right here would be considered a profile. The extrusion would be, for lack of a better word, the, the rubber exterior. Uh, but when we look inside, how does it actually work? Uh, we have flexible conductive strips that run through the, uh, the extrusion. We have a perforated foam spacer, and then we have the astrical on the outside. When the edge is compressed, then it, it creates a, uh, a signal between the uh, conductive uh, um, uh, spacer and strips inside the edge. So that's that's a, a quick uh, review of, of how a, a factory sealed Miller Edge is, is um, constructed. We also have a do-it-yourself edge, which is something that I'm holding in my hand now. Uh, this, instead of having a, an insert, it is actually a dual extrusion or multiple extrusion to where um, the conductive material is extruded inside, uh, inside into the astrical, and you would actually cut this in the field and then glue and install the end plugs to whatever size that, uh, that you folks need. So edge construction, very quickly. 
What's the purpose of an edge? Well, to safeguard people, equipment, materials, the door itself, um, the purpose would be for to stop and reverse the door when it comes into contact with an obstruction. So safety, very important, uh, and edges actually stop and reverse the door when it comes in contact with an obstruction. Uh, moving through construction again, monitored and non-monitored. Hear a lot of that going around in the industry. What's the difference? How do I know? What's the construction? Monitored can be four wire. It can be a two wire edge uh, where we have um, coming outside of the edge, we have either two wires or we have four wires. Uh, two wire would have to be what we call uh, terminated or resisted with, uh, with a capacitor, uh, diode capacitor or uh, a 10K uh, resistor. Non-monitored, which we call ancillary, uh, which would be just a standard two wire. Um, both are still in use. Uh, in August of 2010, uh, monitored devices are now required to be installed on CDOs and we have uh, edges that are available in monitored or non-monitored depending on the application. Uh, ANSI UL325, uh, entrapment protection uh, must be con uh, continuously checked by the operator electronics. So how is that done? Uh, all the CDO manufacturers have a, like a proprietary type of technology in their circuit board. When we hook an edge up to that, um, the edge sensor is being verified either with a four wire or it's being checked uh, with the end of line terminator diode capacitor. Basically the operator is making sure that there's the presence of the edge in, in the signal or, or set of photo eyes. So that's how, how it's uh, actually being monitored. When we remove that presence, whether the wire has been cut, uh, if there's a photo eye installed, the photo eye is obstructed, the operator would go back into a safe mode, which would revert to constant contact to close. Uh, two wire non-monitored, still in use, still a great option for ancillary, of course. Uh, it's reliable performance. It's, uh, it's a technology that we've had for, for a long time. Um, but a failure in the system may go unrecognized. So if we look at the screen, we can see that there's an illustration of, of an edge itself. We have the, the contact and the two wires coming out of the edge. Maybe an instance where one side of the edge is cut in half, one side will actually activate, the other side will not, in two wire, ancillary, non-monitored. Um, it's critically important to test that system on a regular basis. So if you have an uh, older operator out in the field, there's a two wire edge on there. It's important for your technicians uh, to, to test that edge for, for function uh, while they're there or through PMs or however you folks uh, would structure a, a service. Uh, two wire monitored. We can take the same two wire edge and we can actually monitor it. So what we would do in this case, again, we have an illustration of an edge. We would put a resistor in the end. Uh, it's installed inside the edge, so we would do that at the factory. Um, if the proper voltage level is not returned to the operator, uh, failure is indicated and the uh, motor will typically revert back to what we call safe mode. So again, the operator is looking for a return of the signal. If that is not present, then the operator would, would, would actually identify that as a fault uh, and, and go into a safe mode. Four wire, this is a little different. Uh, we have again the same illustration of, of a safety edge, but instead of two wires uh, coming in on one end, we actually have two wires coming in on one end and then two wires coming back out through, so that creates a flow. If that flow is, is, if, is cut in the field or damaged, then again um, the wires uh, align to each uh, end of the two internal contact elements, uh, controls monitor the incoming and outgoing of voltage, again, making the flow through. Any drop in that voltage would indicate a fault. Uh, so a quick illustration for wire edge construction. Uh, Non-monitored products. Lots of great safety products out there. Not everything that Miller Edge sells would be considered a monitored product, uh, but nonetheless, they can be uh, used in conjunction with monitored or in the older technology. We refer to them as ancillary devices. Um, so any device that is not continuously checked by the operator's electronics. Very important. Everybody's familiar with the old gummy hose uh, uh, air diaphragm uh, box that has been around for 50 years. That's still a great seller. 
uh, and it's actually a product that most people are familiar with, uh, that would be considered ancillary. So it is not checked by the operator's electronics uh, to make sure that it's in place uh, and, and monitored for, for safety. Uh, some other ancillary devices would include a light curtain, um, again, pneumatic, uh, airwave technology, dual motion sensors, photoreflective eye, these types of things. These are, are products that we would consider ancillary. Uh, they can be used. Um, they should be used when you're complying with UL325 in conjunction with uh, an approved product, uh, such as a, an, a, one of our edges that's approved or a set of photo eyes that's, that's approved. Okay, here's a, here's a question that I think everybody's been waiting for. This is all great, so how do I measure an edge? Very, very important. I, I laugh when I say this because I have, again, been in the industry for many years, and when I call on dealers, I often see uh, edges that have been mismeasured. Um, so real quick, we'll, we'll go through this. If, if there's any questions, folks, please you know, feel free to, to ask. So I'm in the field and I say I need a new edge for this, this sectional door, how do I measure it? Very, very simple. Uh, measure panel width of the door to determine the active length. So if we look at the illustration and we would say that this panel is 12 foot 2, then we want to order the edge at 12 foot 2 for sectional doors. Real simple. Um, sometimes you'll notice that some of our edges have, a, have extra flapping on them. Don't, don't let that confuse you. This is the actual working portion of the edge. Uh, this part can be trimmed. Uh, of course, you don't want to trim the factory sealed portion, but, but this, this part can be trimmed off uh, if, if need be. So sectional doors, panel length. If the panel's 12-2, then order the edge at 12-2. Simple stuff. And then if, if there's any um, other questions, our inside uh, sales department or outside sales is, is always there to assist you. Um, ordering procedures again. Verify the outlet location, okay? Another, another question that, that comes up a lot with technicians is uh, where, where should the outlet wires exit the edge? Is, does it come out here? Does it come out here, here? We don't know. How, how do we determine this? Uh, is it left, right, or universal? What's the difference? Is it application specific? Um, how do we determine this? Well, if you're on the inside of the building looking out, what side is the motor on? If we look at this illustration, we see a rolling steel door. We have, uh, if we're assuming we're on the inside of the building looking out, we would notice that the operator is on the right side of the coil. Uh, so we would look at our sensing edge here. We would see that uh, we have a junction box and our coil. We could make our, deter we could start to make our, our uh, order and determinations based on, on, on looking at the door from the outside looking out. And again, sometimes it may be application specific. There may be obstructions in the way, it may be a, a motor that's mounted to the exterior of the building and the door is actually mounted to the interior of the building. There could be um, a high left door going up into a ceiling, superimposed door, there's all kinds of things. So, so application specific is, 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 uh, is there for a reason. But we can start by uh, being inside of the building, looking out uh, and determining what side the motor's on. We can use that as a starting point to determine uh, how to how to actually, where our wires go and et cetera. Okay, so how do we connect an edge? Um, you have to choose uh, the correct sensing edge and we need to know the make, model of the door, the operator type, this is important. Um, is there a mounting channel required? Um, what are the field conditions? Is it, is it a special application? It, I put this photo up here for a reason. Um, if you look at the photo closely, you'll notice that it's a very, very tight installation. Uh, there's pretty much zero side room there. So if I were to go there uh, as a salesperson for a door company and say, hey, um, I want to put a new edge on this door, what would, what would I be thinking of? I, I would uh, automatically know by looking at this that I have almost zero side room. So I can imagine if I was there or a technician, technician was there, how would they be able to slide an edge in from the side? I think that a new channel would be in order. That way they could just walk right up to the job instead of having to take the panel off and they could install the edge with the, with the channel on it uh, in, in this uh, kind of condition, making life a lot easier for, for everyone, for sure. Uh, edge connection procedures. We want to verify the wire configuration. This is important also. Is it a two wire or is it a four wire? Uh, is it monitored or non-monitored? 
Um, if, UL if it's a UL325 compliant operator, uh, we need to verify if there's a module that's needed or an end of the line resistor required. Um, real quick, uh, cheat sheet would be any operator that is UL325 compliant, uh, manufactured after August 2010, chances are it's going to need a module uh, or a resistor in the edge itself. So that's a good cheat sheet starting point to go with. Uh, to stray a little bit, we at Miller Edge have available to anyone that inquires a either PDF or paper uh, of um, the majority of the industry's operators and a diagram uh, showing our monitored edge and how to interface that edge uh, to their terminal block uh, and whether a module is needed or not. So I'd be more than happy to get that information out to anybody that needs it. Um, you can, or you can call the plant um, and, and we'll get that out to you. So good stuff for sure. Um, we want to connect to the operator according to the operator instructions. So if we look in the operator instructions, we're going to see how we interface an edge to, uh, to that operator. And again, here is a, an illustration taken from that uh, ordering guide that I just spoke about, which would show an edge interface to a module, interface to dry contacts on an operator. So, so that, that information is out there, folks, for you. It's, it's at no charge. Just let me know if you need it, and I'll, I'll get it out to you. Um, as I just mentioned, most UL-compliant operators require a module. And what this module, it looks just like that. And I, I actually have one out on the table. So after, after we're done with the presentation, if anyone wants to come out, be more than happy to answer questions. Um, so most UL operators are going to require a module. There are a few different types of modules. And again, on, that, on the ordering guide, we, we kind of clarify that for you. Uh, four wire, two wire with a uh, 10K resistor or diode capacitor. We want to refer to the uh, ME ordering guide. So the ordering guide I spoke about will cover all this, what type of module, how does it work, what does it do. Um, connection options. So we've determined how to measure the edge. We know which model it is. We know that we need a, a module to interface it to our operator. Uh, but how are we going to connect the edge to the operator? Uh, well, we can use a coil cord which most people are familiar with. We can use a take-up reel, or we can go wireless. Uh, we're very proud of the fact at Miller Edge that we have the industry's only UL325 compliant wireless transmitter receiver. It is actually monitored and is approved for use. So you folks can use any one of our electric edges that's monitored in conjunction with a wireless, or what we call our monitored edge link, or MEL for short. Uh, you can uh, interface a, an edge wirelessly to the operator and be UL325 compliant. So very good stuff. In the illustration is a pet peeve of mine. Um, I see a door, I see an edge, and then I see an operator, and I see the edge with a coil cord connected to the operator. You'll notice there's a junction box there. That's super, super important. Uh, and the reason why is because it, it, it reduces the stress and wear on, on the coil cord. I have been called by frantic customers saying that your edge doesn't work. Come to find out that the coil cord was stretched all the way up to the ceiling and they didn't use wire nuts, they just kind of rolled them over and the connection came undone. Had they taken the time to spend, I don't know, four, eight, nine, twelve dollars on a junction box, it would have added life to the job, it would have made their customer happier, it would have uh, eliminated that phone call to me at 9.30 at night. And, uh, and also would have just uh, created a goodwill all the way around. So, so some connection methods there. All right, so tech tips. This is for you techs out there. Always use a J-Box when connecting an edge with the coil cord. Super duper important. We sell them. Uh, lots of other folks sell them. Uh, if, uh, if ordering them in bulk is an issue, there are local uh, hardware stores that you can get them at. Please use one. Please do not stretch the coil cord or the edge. Super important stuff. Factory sealed edges. This is a good funny one because I, I actually uh, travel the country from Miller Edge. I meet a lot of different dealers and I call on dealers and they say, yeah, you know, I just cut one of your edges down the other day in, in the field and, and I glued it back in place and it worked fine. And I say, really? He says, oh yeah. Well, we manufacture these edges in our facility. 
Uh, they're factory sealed, and uh, we don't recommend that they're modified in the field. And to, to finish my story, he called me up two months later and he ordered a new edge because that one, that one actually failed. He used a glue or silicone. We, yeah, we, we, these are either hermetically sealed or they're with a special adhesive or done with heat, other methods that we use in our manufacturing process. Uh, so we don't recommend that you modify them in the field um, if it's a factory sealed edge. Um, here's another good bullet point for text. Do not over compress the edge. Does anyone in the room without reading that know what Miller Edge recommends for maximum compression? Well, everybody looked at that, so I'll tell you. It's a quarter of an inch. So we, we, we recommend that you, you don't over compress the edge or compress the edge more than a quarter of an inch. Super important stuff because what ends up happening is, you know, we, we over compress the edge. The edges uh, may develop memory and may prematurely wear out. Uh, so we want to take note of that. Um, another case argument for that would be, well, what if there's a discrepancy in the floor? At that point in time, you can look at other products, brush seals and things like that that can take up that discrepancy if you have to scribe the bottom bar or not the bottom bar but the bottom section or get uh, some sort of a, an extrusion to make up that discrepancy, uh, then, then so be it. But uh, our edges are designed for a, ni a nice seal and for safety uh, entrapment protection. Uh, when we squish them down to, to take up gaps in, in the opening and, and discrepancies, we, we run the risk of over compression for sure. Another very good tip, uh, if you order an edge from, from us or through an OEM and it is shipped to you in a box, this is very important. Um, I happen to be blessed enough to live in Florida, uh, so we don't have to worry about the cold weather so much, but in climates like this and even farther north, um, when an edge is shipped, we want to get it, say it's 30 degrees outside, um, take it out of the box, open it up in your shop uh, or, on, or in the field, allow it to uh, acclimate to the temperature and relax and return to form before installing. Very important because we do ship some of these edges in, in boxes, they're, they're rolled up. Uh, in, in all pliable products, folks, they, they will retain some kind of a memory. It's, it's just the way uh, that that works. So with edges, we ask you to, if they're shipped to you in a box, Please take them out of the box, unroll them, let them acclimate to the environment, let them return to form, and then install them. It shouldn't take any more than 15 minutes uh, for that sort of thing. So these, these small steps can really help out a lot. Uh, you know, in the field with callbacks, technical problems, your guys are out there, everyone's super busy, we just want the job to go smoothly, that, that sort of thing. So, okay, perform a quality risk assessment. Technicians, salespeople, uh, super, super duper important. Um, how do we do that? What is risk assessment? A quick analogy would be this. We all drive, most of us drive automobiles. Every time we get in the car, we put ourselves at risk, right? We have the risk of getting into an accident. There's two things that we can do. We can um, reduce that risk or we can eliminate the risk. We would reduce the risk by driving the speed limit, paying attention to the roadway, the conditions, um, you know, paying attention to how we're driving, that sort of thing. We can eliminate that risk by just not driving at all. Uh, so when we're performing risk assessments in relation to our industry, to the garage door industry, what we want to do is we want to ask questions. We want to have an open mind. We want to have uh, the ability to uh, define how the door is intended to be used and how it may be used. Very important. Uh, Quick example, you go to a firehouse, there's a large 16 by 16 full vision door, um, uh, insulated glass, the whole nine yards. We know that the intention of that door is to warehouse uh, apparatus, fire trucks, right? The door goes up, fire truck comes out, door goes up, fire truck goes in. But we, we may notice that people are using that door just for egress, to get in and out. Instead of walking the 75 yards to the man door, they push the button, this ginormous door goes up, they walk outside, that's not the intended use of that door. However, it's being used that way. Uh, when we're performing a risk assessment, we wanna list the potential risks and hazards. We wanna identify worst case scenarios uh, and potential costs. Now, to think about the firehouse again, if the only 
purpose of that door is to warehouse the fire truck and there are no people ever walking in and out of it, then that would be, that would be an ideal situation. But we know that there are people walking in and out of it. So now we say, hey, not only do we run a, a risk of injuring or damaging the fire truck itself, or the door not opening up in the event of an emergency, now we have people walking in and out of it, and now we have personnel to protect as well as just inanimate objects. Um, we want to look at these worst case scenarios and the potential costs. What do you mean cost? Well, if Joe is an auto mechanic and he has two bays, and one of those bays is not working, then he's losing probably half of his revenue for that day. So that would be a huge cost in that situation. Uh, downtime, injuries, frequency of occurrence, et cetera. We want a list of potential safety devices that could reduce the risk hazard coupled with the advantages and disadvantages. Oftentimes, a safety edge is not enough. Oftentimes, a safety edge and a set of photo eyes is not enough. Sometimes, just a set of photo eyes is enough. It's all per job, case specific, and it, you will be able to identify these strengths and weaknesses by performing a risk assessment. Maybe it needs uh, a motion detector, a set of eyes, and an edge, or a loop detector and a light curtain. So we can identify these weaknesses and come up with viable solutions for our customers based on performing a risk assessment. Okay, so why install an edge? Well, it reduces the risk of injury, entrapment, or worse. Uh, it provides door-to-floor protection, so when the door is in the up position and is actuated to move downwards, as soon as the door is actuated, that edge is working, uh, and it is, will detect uh, an obstruction. Uh, it reduces the risk of downtime associated with non-working or damaged door. Uh, it reduces the, 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 um, the need for conduit. So we can provide a wireless edge which would eliminate the conduit for a photo eye situation if, if that is an issue. Uh, it provides a finished look uh, and creates a seal. Um, and they're easy to install. So, so some good, good stuff. All right, again, testing an edge in the field for the technicians and folks out there that have got their hands on the product. Two people needed to perform correctly. Very important, never operate door unless you have a full unobstructed view uh, of the entire opening. If you have a push button behind a wall and the door is not within your view, please don't operate that door uh, and assume you can just walk around and make sure that there's something, uh, everything is right because we know the law, Murphy's Law, et cetera. Um, never stand directly under the door when it's closing and remember the three count rule. Uh, so, how do we test the edge by hand or with board? Um, control operator in the downward motion. Catch the door in your hand. Uh, it should stop and reverse upon activating the edge. Uh, or you can place a two by four wood block on the floor under the door. Uh, when the door strikes the two by four wood block, it should remain in contact uh, not more than three seconds. So that's a, a good test for, for folks out there in the field. Um, any questions? No questions? Okay. Great. Thank you all so much.